Welcome to the Talking Toughness series of podcasts, where we examine the mental toughness concept with guests from a wide range of sectors, illustrating that our mental approach to what happens to us and around us matters for all of us. Our guests come from the worlds of business and public service, education, social mobility, sport and health. They all share their experiences and their observations about the factors that have enabled them to survive and to thrive on their journey through life. Many guests have gone further and incorporated the concept into what they do as coaches, trainers, managers and leaders, helping others to thrive in their turn. Their experiences are valuable to those of us who strive to do the same. We have with us today, Darren. Darren is an experienced leader, executive coach and facilitator with over 25 years experience of partnering with people and teams who work in high pressure environments. And that includes the armed forces, the education sector and financial services. Darren cut his teeth as a coach while serving as a Royal Marines commando at the prestigious commando training center. As a key member of the Royal Marines coaching advisory team, he coached military staff and students on all aspects of learning and performance. Now in 2012, Darren became head of coaching for an education charity, Teaching Leaders, where he was responsible for the national coaching strategy. Leading a team of around 30 coaches, this was a hugely successful enterprise. It was also where he first came across our version of the mental toughness concept and measure. In 2015, Darren joined Barclays UK, where he became head of coaching for Barclays UK COO. In this role, he led a team of coaches whose purpose was to support Barclays cultural transformation objectives. Now, we're recording this at the end of November 2022. In a couple of weeks, Darren moves to a new role with a very major organization in the Middle East. Darren's career has enabled him to acquire a breadth of experience and skills related to the strategic use of internal coaching, leadership and talent development, executive and team coaching, coaching supervision, and of course, mental toughness training. And whilst he was doing all this, he managed to find the time during 2022 to co-author a book on team coaching. So welcome, Darren. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Doug. Delighted to be here with you and John today and to talk about all things toughness. Um, really looking forward to learning with you and from you today through this process. Well, we're really looking forward to uh, this conversation. And perhaps we can start with, I mean, you've got such a grounding in coaching that you can teach so many people about every aspect of coaching there is. But where did your first connection between a mental toughness concept and coaching come from? It's a really good question. Um, my, my first sort of experience was uh, the Commando Training Centre when I was uh, an instructor in the Royal Marines. Um, I was very privileged um, to apply for a role um, within the Royal Marines for, um, to become a coach. Um, Institute of Naval Medicine and Bangor University did a study in around 1999 um, that concluded in 2001 that looked at Royal Marine recruit training, looked at the elite organisation which the Royal Marines wear and the wonderful instructional cadre, but concluded that we're an elite organisation, but our education and training practices would rapidly uh, lead us to becoming obsolete unless we really adopted a new way of leading and training our students. Um, their sort of ethos was to move from uh, a trainee or move from a select out culture to a training culture. Um, predominantly, we, we worked on the 99% need not apply. Um, out of the 1% that did apply, only a very small number got through training. And it wasn't largely because they just didn't have the skills or the attributes to cut it. It's often as a result of standards creeping up that, that push people to the outliers that didn't make it through. And interestingly, as a Royal Marine recruit, uh, 16 years old, 
I didn't get through training the first time. I don't think I was emotionally ready for it. Physically, I think I probably was, but I didn't have the, the emotional sort of resilience, I think, at the time to get to the end of training. So I ended up being backclassed. But I learned through that experience, got through Royal Marine recruit training, um, and then started my journey of 24 years within the Royal Marines, which the culminative sort of years were was within this Royal Marines coaching advisory team, um, which was really about introducing transformational leadership skills, coaching skills that enabled students to develop their resilience, their confidence, their self-esteem, um, that would stay with them long after the training had ended. So it was a, it was a real cultural shift within the Royal Marines. It's such an interesting place to start, you know, like, the idea of I went off and tried to join the Royal Marines at 16. Right? So uh, difficult to think of a better jump off point for a discussion on mental toughness. I, I'm interested then, Darren, what, what was it that you reflected on in those? Because we, we know that young, but particularly young lads are not great at reflecting generally. Um, so what was it that happened from that kind of, uh, failure to get in uh, as a 16 year old between then and, and the successful recruitment? Good, good question, John. I think, I think there are a number of factors. I, I think you're quite right. I, I don't think I was aware of the ability to reflect. And interesting, when I, I started out as a coach in my development as a coach, I remember my own coach saying to me, What do you do to reflect? And I just go, Well, catch myself in the mirror in the morning while having a shave. Um, that's about it. You don't have time to slow down and, and do the reflection sort of piece. You just make the magic happen. But that's, as we know, is a load of nonsense. It, there are moments where you do stop and reflect. I think I stopped and reflect a number of times whilst in training. I think that the, the most instrumental moments is that I really wanted it. I had a very clear purpose uh, at 16 years old, that the green berry is what I wanted. I just didn't know how to get there. Um, so I think it goes back to that old adage, you know your why. My why was I didn't want to go back home. I grew up in a, uh, a wonderful town, but a coal mining town in, in the East Midlands, um, which, which was a wonderful place. But I, was a, I was, grew up on a council estate. I was an only child and I was mollycoddled by my mother. Um, and I wanted to get away from that. So I didn't want to go back to that. So that was a driving force because I knew that actually to... To, to grow as a person that I needed to be away from my sort of family home where I didn't do anything really. <laughs> and yeah. the, the Royal Marines was, was a real goal of mine from 15 years old. I watched a programme called Behind the Lines, um, which you can still get on BBC iPlayer now, which was about the Royal, Royal Marines mountain and Arctic warfare carder. Um, and I just thought, I want to do what they do. That looks really exciting. And so I did my own work. Um, around Royal Marine recruit training. I went to apply when I was 15. They said, look, grow up for a year, come back when you're 16. And I used my pocket money at the time to get on a bus to travel from my own town into Nottingham on my 16th birthday and went through the recruitment process then. But it was from those moments, it was just like, why do I want to do this? And it was like, I don't want to go backwards, I want to go forwards. And, and it was the drive to have a green berry to embody what it meant to be a Royal Marine Commando. I had visions of um, the guys in the Falklands War, of all the services that were involved in that, and the, the wonderful things that they gave us um, through, through that conflict. And, but also what I'd aspired to be through this um, mountain Arctic warfare car that, that I observed on the TV and just thought, I want that. That's what drove me forward. And that's what kept me going through, really is re real sense of purpose. And I, 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 what, what fascinates me about that answer there, Darren, is the, the sense of purpose and the kind of drive to get outside the comfort zone is, is there. You, you didn't kind of mention anything about belief or ability or anything like that. Did you ever think, do I actually have the ability to do it? Do I <laughs> <laughs> no, so it's, again, it's another great question. I think, I think there were moments where I didn't think I'd make a Marine as long as my backside pointed south. I think the <laughs> Carter gave me, gave me that belief as well. I mean, I, I got to week 11 of Royal Marine recruit training. I had a real wobble. Um, 
I didn't realize at that time that wobble and verbalizing that wobble, wobble would have meant that I got backclassed. Um, I was um, in, in training the week 11, you do what's a, called a PT sort of assessment and you have PT superiors mm. and the PT superiors are given a red vest. And the red vest means that you're being watched specifically um, and you get an award at the end of it um, to, to recognize you for, for the qualities that you, you, you demonstrate within the gym. I was given one of those red vests, um, but I don't remember leaving the gym. I, I, I collapsed at some point, putting every bit of effort and energy into getting this sort of PT superior. And I left that, I was desperately unhappy, desperately disappointed in myself. And I thought, I'll go and speak to my instructor, I'm going to tell him how I'm feeling. And, and it, was, it, was, it was a big mistake, I think, at the time. So I told him how I was feeling, they heard what I said. Um, and I said, I don't know how I'm going to cope with the rest of the training, if I've struggled on this. Um, I need to go back. I need to do it again. I need another chance. And he heard what I said, so put me back back into a back class sort of system to go back to week eight from week eleven and start over yeah. again. And I think that 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 was a, a key learning moment for me in terms of be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I got what I wish, but actually one of the best things that ever happened to me because I think going backwards, people look at it as a stigma that, oh, you're backlash, you didn't get through raw marine recruit, recruit training first time. Well, interesting enough, the vast majority of people that apply for recruit training either don't get through or don't get through first time because of the high demands physically and mentally on people. So actually going backwards gives you an opportunity to learn. And I think it was through those moments that I learned a lot about myself. I learned how to move forward in spite of the challenges. I didn't have any coping skills at that time. Um, and interestingly enough, the role that I was later to have in my career was about equipping all military students with the tools and techniques that was readily available in other elite environments, such as a sporting arena, to enable people to cope with the demands of those kind of environments. So I, I, I started to develop coping skills after that, but I wasn't consciously aware of them. Uh, that's, that's, that's brilliant, Darren. It's so interesting to kind of see such a, a sort of positive approach towards what some might perceive as failure but a, a back step you know I like that in the sense of that kind of opportunity to learn a little bit more and go again I think is um is, is kind of core really to a lot of the stuff we talk about in, in mental toughness yeah, I, I absolutely. I mean, you, you look at the four C's as a whole. I mean, I think just even having a general awareness of the, those those four components, let alone the eight factors, would have been eye opening at the time because you can think about your your life control, your emotional control, and how you manage that more effectively. And I think in the arduous environment of raw recruit training and the environments after that, having an understanding of those factors and actually the strategies that you can employ to steady your internal boat would have been um, a real gift at that time. And, and consequently, um, when I joined the Royal Marines Coaching Advisory Team in 2006, that's when I really went to school. I think I had some skills uh, as an instructor within the Royal Marines and a leader within the Royal Marines before then, but I had nothing to hang my coat on. And it was really learning about those strategies. I was sent to university to do a degree in education and training and up that, until that point uh, in my career I had no formal education no GCSEs no CSEs no O levels but I was put through an educational process that would teach me about education but in tandem to that I was the whole team we had access to a whole variety of people in um, the educational world sports psychology world people in other military environments teaching us about these wonderful skills that I think have served me well through my career since then, but hopefully have served other leaders, instructors um, in a variety of different contexts incredibly well. That's brilliant, Darren. <clears throat> so you, you've obviously got a lot out of the experience with the Marines uh, in several ways. You then moved on to working for an educational charity can you perhaps tell us a little bit about those challenges because they'll be quite different. 
Uh, very different, and, and but so many parallels as well. I mean, I mean, the first thing is he's leaving the military after twenty four years, uh, and then finding yourself thinking about what what can you do, uh, and where can you apply yourself is was was the biggest challenge. Because I think having a good sense of purpose, my purpose has always been to try and create opportunities for people to thrive irrespective of circumstance. Certainly, that was the case within the Royal Marines, whether that was military students or instructional card and leaders. Um, when I was searching the, the Guardian jobs, LinkedIn for other opportunities, I stumbled upon teaching leaders. And I, I think what the Royal Marines taught me is that if you think you've got half a chance of getting through a process, give, you, give it a go, um, be courageous. And I saw a job for a head of coaching for this national educational charity it was based out in Manchester. But one of the essential criteria must have been a senior school leader, head teacher, and worked in a school in challenging circumstances. But all the desirable skills is around coaching, performance, leading other people. I thought, you know what, I'm going to stick, stick my CV in. And it was the best thing that I ever did because I, I then was very successful in the interview and assessment process. Uh, and that taught me one thing is that if you do believe in something and you believe in yourself, back to John's point, because I had that sense of belief at that point, um, you, you can really change your own life opportunities. Um, and I was really successfully recruited into that role. And that just gave me a, a great deal of opportunity to work with the most fantastic um, leaders, teachers um, in, a, in a totally different world, in, in that sort of charity sector. And having been a schoolboy who was academically stunted, I think, probably a little bit by the educational system, but largely by my own beliefs. I left school with a black eye and a blazer and no qualifications. To be able to work in that space and give others something back was a great opportunity. And the, the Teaching Leaders Programme was all about if raising the leadership within the school system. And if you raise the leadership within the school system, kids get a better life chance as a result of it. And, and I think there's no better place to work than an educational system to give something back in that sort of space. And I had this wonderful team of coaches that started out with four. By the time I left, I had 33 school leaders who was working around 177 schools, supporting school leaders develop their, their sort of leadership abilities, their transformational leadership abilities. And part of that program, this two-year program, was introduced into the whole concept of mental toughness, um, which, which was a wonderful sort of learning opportunity because it just suddenly went, oh, my God, it's a bit like coaching. I didn't have a label for coaching when I was first introduced to coach. I thought I'd do that. And th those tools and techniques I use gave me something to have a coat on. And suddenly the whole concept of mental toughness went, ah, here's something that can enhance my coaching or importantly, hence the coaching skills of the leaders that we're trying to support in schools. And so we, in partnership with AQR, we introduced the whole concept of mental toughness. It was part of a two-year programme. The school leaders got um, coached over those two years. They had their own individual coach. We introduced the concept through workshops. But the most important thing is we we gave prompts for whatever people were taught on the program. And the coaches were also given tools and techniques to coach using some of those components around the four C's. And that was, that, that was a game changer because we were able to track those interventions that had the greatest impact. The biggest one was the development of self-awareness. And if you think about that, that sort of concept of learning orientation, I still think learning orientation is the beating art of the 4C model. I know it sits under risk, but to me, I'd shift it inwards <laughs> and around as a wraparound as well. Uh, well, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with, with that, Darren. The, the, just for a moment, one of the things that I'm picking up from your story is this idea that you've come out of the military, you've had <clears throat> an absolutely fantastic education and you've been able to move into an entirely different environment, even though in some ways you didn't meet the spec of that job. And that illustrates something because John and I speak very often to people with a military background 
in North America, especially the United States. And they have excellent training for their officers, but they seem to be valued in a different way than people are valued coming out of the military in the UK. I mean, it's very common for somebody to leave the military in, the, in North America to go straight into a senior position in an organization. So I love that aspect of your story. No, thank you. I remember the, the that project very well. It was very successful, um, especially in terms of outcomes. You then move in due course to Barclays. Yeah. Where, I mean, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that and particularly about a particular, the, the study that you carried out that eventually formed part of your master's degree. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it's an interesting story. And one, it's an interesting story about the ability to be able to transition from one environment to another, to your point, moving from the military to the education sector, then to find yourself in the, the financial services sector, where I never would have imagined that I'd ever would have worked. Um, but I think having that core, core skill set in terms of coaching, leadership, they're, they're easily transferable skills to any environment because if, if you let go of the notion that your job as a leader is to fix things when it's not, it's really about to inspire people, um, empower people and grow people. Well, you can put yourself within any context. The job of a leader is not to be an SME. It's, it's really to be able to galvanize people together. And I, I was approached via LinkedIn, interestingly enough, for, uh, by Barclays. For, for this sort of coaching role. And I was curious enough to go along for the interview. Um, and I was successful in the interview process. And I thought, you know what, I, I, I love where I'm at, but actually this is another growth opportunity for me to step outside of my comfort zone and move into a different space and actually see if I could fit in, in that sort of space. And interesting, I've been in Barclays literally eight years um, since, since I left teaching leaders. And uh, it's been a phenomenal experience of, enabling leaders to be able to grow in an environment that is is relatively challenging. Barclays has been a wonderful place for me, and it gave me an opportunity to go back to school again um, and do a, a Master's of Science with Cranfield University, um, where I, I took the opportunity to focus my thesis on an area that I was fascinated by. So the teaching leaders gave me some real insight into the whole concept of mental toughness and the benefits to school leaders and the transferable benefits to school students. I thought, well, actually, if mental toughness works in the military, it works in the education sector. If we developed a program within Barclays that incorporated um, the psychological skills that are connected to mental toughness, would that enable employee well-being? We, we know in, in most environments that well-being, mental health, um, if it's not promoted actively, um, has a significant impact on performance. And all the research that I was doing at the time highlighted that in general terms, for every pound or every dollar that an organisation invests in, in, in mental health and well-being interventions, organisations can get a five pound or a $5 return on the investment. I don't know exactly how true it is, but I thought, you know what, it sounds like it makes sense. So I I set about focusing my thesis on this this particular topic. Um, One week was great for me as a practitioner of coaching to to delve into the academic sort of world. I'm not an academic by any sort of means. I think I'm more of a pracademic in terms of I've got practical experience And I try to use academic rigor to support what I do. So when I'm explaining what mental toughness is or coaching is or team coaching is, people understand the why behind it before you go into the how do we develop it. Um, COVID hit in the middle of my thesis. I was meant to have 50 um, colleagues to work with um, over a period of time. The period of time was going to be around 12 to 15 weeks. I ended up with 10 colleagues <laughs> but over eight weeks. So I had to adapt my approach significantly. I had to adapt the program that I planned. So I used the MTQ Plus as, as the benchmark assessment for this program and also be able to hopefully identify 
the most appropriate interventions in the limited period I've got to support our colleagues' development. In a nutshell, I identified that um, the programme would be eight weeks. It would involve an introduction to the concept of mental toughness, so people would understand what it is, why it is beneficial. I introduced some of the core sort of strategies within that sort of session that was based around the four C's. Um, and then following that initial sort of workshop, I provided everybody with a one-to-one, -one, an individual coaching session focused on the area that they had identified as a result of the feedback that they got as well from their um, MTQ plus report how to work around their development in that area. We also did a collective team learning review. Now, team learning review, after action review, I think they're, they're absolutely key to embedding learning of any shape or form. Far too often, in my view, um, organisations invest in using tools, uh, a variety of psychometrics, pull them off the shelf, they give them to people, there's no follow-up. So you tell somebody they're a, a fiery red or they're a a learner or they're, they're a plant or whatever it might be, but they don't know what to do with it. What I, I used was the whole concept of mental toughness to unpack it and enable people to understand it in a way that was simple for them, but also enable them to move forward with in, interdependently of my help. Um, so the learning reviews was incredibly powerful. Um, we then did a wrap up sort of session at the end of the eight weeks and, and con the conclusion was is the before and after results, um, there was a 34% increase in confidence, for example, um, which, which I thought was a phenomenal shift. In large part, everybody reported that the biggest thing that made the difference was self-awareness, the habit of daily reflection. So that's what we, we, we built in a mindset routine, a morning mindset routine and an evening mindset routine to help people reflect purposefully. So rather than just leaving it to a whim to how they felt in the moment, it's just at the start of the day, at the end of the day, how do you feel? Now, the interesting thing is that when I did the learning review at the end, without exception, all of those leaders that I did this program with had introduced the concept to their own teams and importantly built in the habit of daily reflection in their morning huddles with their teams. Um, and they said the shift in mindset, behaviour was significant. And interestingly, long after the programme, when I caught up with those leaders, they said actually they'd had no absenteeism since the end of the programme in light of all COVID going on. So there was some real positive attributes as a result of it. Overall mental toughness, it was 24%. And I think in eight weeks, that's phenomenal. Mm. Imagine what you could yeah. do with a, a, a much more sustainable programme. And it is only a snapshot of a window. And there may be of other factors that have contributed to their well-being, their improvements across the four factors. But I thought as an as initial benchmark, I thought, wow, this is powerful stuff. Mm. Uh, and how kind of intensive was that, that eight weeks, Darren? Like how much of the sort of the participants in there, how much of their time do you think was was dedicated to it in that in those eight weeks? So from an interaction with me, it was relatively minimal. But I think what they did collectively outside of that and individually, mm. the, the, the biggest change was, was, was things like being aware of what they say yes to and say no to. So some of the things that we looked at was um, time management uh, and prioritization. So as, as one of those sort of looks at everybody looking, I mean, without exception, I think I got everybody to share the diary with me in the one-to-one -one, and we identified what were the high value activities? What were the low value activities? So they were suddenly finding themselves with more hours a week than they had to focus on their self-development. Mm -hmm. I, I think within Barclays, like any other organization, most of the leaders are too busy being busy <laughs> to find the time for their own development. And they always say, but who, who do you put first? Well, it's my family, my friends, my team, our business. And the reality of it is, is that you've got to start putting yourself first. You don't put yourself first. How can you ever give your best for other people? So the, the whole mantra through that program and, and actually since then really is self-care matters and it's yeah. not selfish. 
yeah i i mean trying to uh i suppose speaking from experience but trying to sort of lead and manage teams um do you know when you're tired and you're run down and you're burnt out you don't you don't do anybody any favors <laughs> no not it's, it's almost an impossible task to to create an environment where other people can thrive if you're not thriving yourself yeah oh, i remember it just I, like i always thought i was quite patient i remember there was a point where i was definitely feeling a bit burnt out and you just you just start getting impatient with people like you know you don't quite take that time to think okay well if they haven't done what they were going to do like what might be the reason for that you, you know you almost you don't have that sort of mental capacity available to you that resource available when you're when when you're stressed and you're wrecked and you're burnt out so you just kind of whatever the first whatever the first thing that pops into your head the first reason that's the one you run with and then yeah yeah I, but my my standard that. question for nearly almost almost always the leads i work with and go my either my team are not performing as well as they could have done or actually there, there's things going on for them right now where they're, they're not at their optimum individually or or collectively so they're not operating to the sum of their parts my stock question is how is your team a reflection of who you are and how mm -hmm. you're leading um or or or, or strong and still how are your results a reflection of who you are and how you're leading because we, we've always got to look inwards and at, at some level we've got to take ownership and accountability for the results that we get so if your team are not um performing to the best of their ability or they're just about surviving the challenges that they're facing well we need to think about actually what do we do to change that is it is it down to my my, my own sort of mindset is are they a reflection of my behaviors um what can i do to change that dynamic in a in a positive and productive way and it's not nice to look inwards at that level always because if if your team are on the edge of burnout and you've been a contributing factor of that that that's not mm. a nice thing because nobody wants that to happen it's like well what, what are you going to do in the light of that what needs to change more often than not it's, it's us we need to change yeah I, I i love the kind of uh theme of reflecting even to the point that things like the time management you know open and dive such a practical um such a practical solution to something but i i like that the focus is on look, looking backwards looking at the progress but i like that everything you're describing there darren is that before you even think about where you're going next it's about really valuing what you've already achieved what yeah. learning opportunities you've been through and then it's carrying that forward and have you any experience of this i've definitely seen it where people seem to think uh, forget that goal setting smart goals what do we want to achieve how do we get there and just think ah geez like stop <laughs> take take time look backwards yeah i think i think the biggest thing john is is, is i think goal, goal setting is, is is quite cliche really in fact from, from a coaching perspective I, I i spend very little time working with individual goals and i certainly don't do vision boards with people what I, I try to focus on is being brilliant at the basics and being brilliant at the basics for me is purpose, identity, values, um, mm -hmm. beliefs, um, behaviours and focusing on what got you here, what will get you where you're going next and really focusing on that sort of who you are is how you lead, who you are is how you perform, who you are is how you coach and, and, and understanding those things is really powerful. and. The game changer for me in all of this is self awareness. I, I, I genuinely, back in two thousand and five, when I worked with my own sort of coach, and I, I literally scoffed when they suggested that that I, I reflect. I had visions of having to go to paper chase and getting a, a, a blank book with a pug on the front of it and pouring out all my emotions in a book. And go, I thought, well, that's that's not my image of how I want to operate. And they really helped me understand that reflection is the foundation of everything you do that enables you to be successful and they they got me to look at when, when i was taking the room through training what is it that you did in that space that made a difference in a positive way what is it you did that got in the way 
What's got in your own way? And I was thinking, oh, God, there's so much. What I think people need is uh, either to invest in their own sort of mechanism or strategy for developing self-awareness or partnering with somebody, a coach, a mentor, a trusted advisor, somebody's going to hold you to account, but also enable you to see what you may not see without having a conversation. So mm. shining the light on the best of you or the best of your team. I mean, one of the things I learned and I took for granted in the Marines that I think is missing largely in the business world is planning and preparation before every operation, before every exercise. You went into infinite detail of what you was going to do, how you was going to do it, and all of the actions you would take if it went wrong. Um, and afterwards, you would always do the after-action review. I'm not a big fan of this agile concept of post-mortems and pre-mortems. It suggests that something is dead. But I think learning reviews before and after are critical. But also learning during. I mean, it's one thing I learned and through my coaching work, but actually it was on my master's where my, my tutors were really pulling me apart on how I was thinking about who I am as a leader that I learned the most. Darren, you've mentioned the word team several times. And as we know, you've begun to develop a really keen interest in team coaching, which is quite different to one-to-one -one coaching. And you've, you know, you've actually co-authored a book on it. Can you tell us a little bit about why you're interested in team coaching and what's so special about team coaching? Yeah, um, thanks, Doug. I mean, oh, crikey, team coaching. I mean, we, we, we spent such a long part of our sort of history and certainly the largest part of my adult life focusing on individual development as, as the perceived panacea to uh, achieving high performance in all sort of areas. But I, I think I, I, I learned as a, as a recruit in Royal Marine training, uh, I know about it emphasised in every other environment that I've ever worked in, is that the heroic leader is dead. It's long lived the team. Leaders can't achieve what they need to achieve for their businesses or whatever organisation they're in without the support of others. So my, my fascination for this project is it's how do you achieve sustainable high performance? Um, and it's through, through teamwork. It's through this whole idea is that support the individual, you will definitely get some benefits, but support the system that they are part of you're going to lead to more sustainable changes in learning, behaviour and performance. So my, my fascination, I think, started within the Royal Marines, although I perhaps didn't appreciate it then, but it certainly grew when I moved into the education sector, um, where I saw school leaders coming together with their own sort of teams, uh, working together to achieve greater outcomes for children. Uh, and in the business sector, I see it all the time, I mean, particularly with Embarkers at the moment, I think it's some of the great opportunities for our business at the moment have been created through teams learning how to work well together, but also with other teams as well. So being that sort of systemic sort of approach, because often teams can work in silo with, with others. I mean, I've, I've seen that in a number of different environments where they, they, internally they, they all get on great together. They all seem to know what they're doing, but when they look inwards or they look outwards and others look inwards, people are not sure what it is that they do, why they exist, what's their purpose, what's their identity, how do they model the values um, with others. And I think, again, that the 4C concept is, is a really useful vehicle here. I mean, if you look at commitment um, it, it, as an entity on its own, just asking a team without doing an assessment, how committed are you to a shared purpose? How committed are you to our shared goals? If you look at control, how are you exerting influence in your own environment? Um, challenge, how are you adapting to the demands of the environment and your stakeholders? So the four C's can play a, a really key role within this space as well. That's brilliant, Darren. That's a, a wonderful little uh, piece about the book because the book is called team coaching, and it's about how to develop a mentally tough, high-performing team. That's a wonderful little uh, uh, advert for the book there. I think we've been 
talking for about 50 minutes. I think this is a quite a good time to bring the conversation to a halt. What I've really, really enjoyed, Darren, and I've, I've met you many, many times, um, I just love your clarity about what coaching is about. I can imagine that the people who work with you, your coachees, must find it exhilarating and eye-opening to be able to uh, deal with you. I also, the, the big takeaway for me, although it's in a sense is not a takeaway, because it's this term self-awareness, because it's become a big part of what we do. I mean, we're very committed to the mental toughness concept, but it is a concept and it's, it works if people become self-aware about the mental toughness. It doesn't, it doesn't just sit there on its own. So yeah. well, I think for anybody listening, this idea of self-awareness is important. Mm. I also think there's some remarkable clarity in the way that you've described the coaching process. And I think even experienced coaches are going to learn from that. Mm. I, I, I like, um, I, I, again, that sense of self-awareness, the, the reflection. And, and we all say this. It, it doesn't necessarily matter what your mental toughness profile looks like, but knowing it and understanding it and knowing your purpose and what you want to achieve and what you're good at means that you can use that. Or you might identify where you need some strategies. But I think the thing that I, the thing I like most is the idea that you would see a job in, that's an education-based job and you have no qualifications, you don't meet any of the, um uh, essential criteria but they but i can do that job <laughs> I'm, I'm going for it um and i think just that uh, that that kind of view of moving away from just simple hard what certificates do i have what's the title of the job and looking at actually what what's the job look like and what am i good at and what do you need to be good at i i think such a that sort of refreshing way to move out of this really siloed linear approach to what you're supposed to do in the workplace so uh yeah really i, I think it gives a lot of food for thought so darren if um, somebody's listening to this and they want to make contact with you how can they connect with you the best place is, is probably through linkedin um, I, I am on other social media platforms, such as Twitter, but I, I'm, I'm a bit of a philistine with it, if I'm entirely honest with you, and don't use it as effectively as I probably should. Um, not on TikTok, Darren? <laughs> yeah, maybe not on TikTok. I, somebody gave me a bit of an education in TikTok the other day, and I thought, you know what, I'll park that one for now. <laughs> um, but, but LinkedIn is, is probably the place that I'm most sort of active. Um, and definitely, I, I respond to people all the time. I mean, I... I think every Friday, without exception, over the last sort of few months, I've spoken to somebody differently around, and it's sharing learning. I mean, this is a wonderful thing about people who are involved in either education or coaching or leadership, is wanting to share what they've learned through the process. Yeah. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to share all of that because I think it's, it's beneficial to me, but also it's beneficial to others as well. How useful has the mental toughness concept been to you in coaching well, it's, it, it's, it's been significantly um powerful in so much that it gives people and the coach more importantly a vehicle to have a conversation around not just these four key constructs commitment control challenge and confidence but the the eight factors that that can help define who we are and how we show up it's it's a vehicle for a conversation that for me is is the bit that makes the difference. And um, importantly, it enables you to help develop strategies that are targeted, rather than leaving it to guesswork and go, let's do something on breath work and mindfulness to think it might be a good thing. It might be a good thing for a different person, for the person you're working with, it may not be. So it enables you to be more targeted on a one-to-one -one level, but also a team level. You wanna develop synchronicity within a team use use this model um, would be my sort of advice. Thank you, Darren. That's brilliant.